Author F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote, For what it's worth, it's never too late to be whoever you want to be. There is no time limit. Start whenever you want. You can change or stay the same. There are no rules to this thing. We can make the best or worst of it. I hope you make the best of it. I hope you see things that startle you. I hope you feel things you never felt before. I hope you meet people who have a different point of view. I hope you live a life you're proud of. And if you're not, I hope you have the courage to start all over again. I found this quote a couple years ago while looking for last minute advice to include in my eldest son's high school graduation present. I had been thinking a lot about identity, the identity he had cultivated through high school and still struggled with as he entered college, not in single mother knowing what he wanted, but instead harboring a passion for his art, the art of rapping and making rap music. My own identity didn't elude me. Once a young single mother of this boy, and now a remarried woman with two more boys, twin two-year-olds at the time, my husband and I titled these years, Diapers and a Teenager. <laughs> While thinking on this topic, how one builds a life toward a dream, the word identity came up a lot. Currently, identity has a lot of cultural weight, like we heard about two weeks ago during Krista's excellent sermon. But if you'll indulge me for a moment, one of my favorite things to do is to take a word that interests me a word I think I understand, and look into its etymology. Where did this word come from, and how has it changed over history? So identity originates in the Latin language. Its root is idem, which means same. Idem became identitas in late Latin, and eventually identity, meaning identical. So at its Latin root, identity means same, or identical. Identity, as it is defined in our contemporary context, means individuality or selfhood, a quality or character that distinguishes you from others. Identity is then what makes you one of a kind. It is what makes you unique. The way I put this together, identity is sameness. It's what brings people together. Friends, lovers, community. Like equals like. And identity is who we are as individuals and who we grow into. Our uniqueness is a combination of what we are born with and what we acquire, believe, and discover about ourselves. Therefore, in my conclusion, identity is both deeply personal and openly universal. The most honest eye is inextricably tied to the mysterious you. Or, as my husband would say, you are a unique, beautiful snowflake, just like everyone else. So that's enough of your etymology lesson for the morning. Um, so now, if you would, come with me on a little journey. Come with me back to the year 2002. It's pre-dinner time. In the kitchen, on the stove sizzles olive oil, garlic, ginger, and soy sauce. Adjacent to the kitchen, the dryer tumbles and the washing machine whirs. On the other side of the kitchen, on the dining room floor, my five-year-old son puts together Duplo bricks. The cats meow to come inside. I'm 28, a single mother, a bartender, a college student. I turn the stove down to simmer. I head toward the pile of laundry on my bed, then see my son's backpack, pick it up, and empty out the day's papers. I look toward my office and the paperwork on my desk, a Cleopatra, a Cleopatra essay I need to finish, a Shakespeare story to analyze, a stack of bills. The dryer stops. I drop what I'm doing. On the way, I pull a piece of salmon from its package on the counter and place it in the pan. I throw another pile of clothes on my bed. From the other room I hear, Mommy, will you build with me? After dinner, sweet pea, I said, let's set the table. 
I place napkins and forks in his hands. His lunchbox is on the counter. I throw away its contents and take out bread and peanut butter, then remember the laundry will wrinkle. But the fish needs to be flipped. The washing machine stops. Cleopatra calls. Don't forget the jelly again. Dinner. Lunch. Homework. Laundry. Bills. Don't forget the filthy bathroom. The circling cats. Playtime. I focus my eyes and realize I am walking in circles. Literally walking in circles. I don't know how long I've been doing it. I don't know if it's the first time. I don't know if my five-year-old sat on the floor thinking, well, there she goes again. For nine years, Bronnie Ware, a palliative care nurse, sat beside hospice patients during their last months, weeks, and moments of life. Over time, she recognized a pattern of regrets expressed by her patients. This inspired her to write an article titled Regrets of the Dying about the top five regrets she heard. The regrets she heard most often came in at number one. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. How does one begin to live a life true to themselves? Begin to build your life toward a dream? I do not by any means have the answers. I actually believe no one has all the answers because the journey is different for everyone. The journey is an individual one. What we do have is sharing our experiences and our process. We have our stories. Chani Nicholas, an astrologer whose approach in writing I find both interesting and thoughtful, advised to this. And I'm Pisces, by the way, so all the Pisces in the room may want to take note. Uh, Chani Nicholas wrote, You reconnect with your power when you actively engage with the unknown. The key word here for me is actively, as if to say it's not just enough to have an awareness of the unknown, but the key is to reach and engage it. What that power is, I'm guessing, is up to each one of us. So in 2002, I was in over my head. I didn't know how to prioritize my responsibilities. Instead of actively engaging with the unknown, I allowed the unknown to control me. I didn't know how to do more than grasp at tasks that floated to the top of my stack. I didn't know how to be the person I wanted to be in the moment I wanted to be her. My power was in surviving. I'm not saying I think that surviving is the wrong way to approach a situation. On the contrary, I've survived through many obstacles and never have I experienced the worst of human conditions. Survival oftentimes is the only and best option. What I am saying is that, is that the moment I caught myself walking in circles, changing priorities second after second, just to get through a weekday night, I realized the control over my life, or the control I felt over my life, was a false one. It was the moment I recognized I was approaching my life all wrong, but I had no idea what to do about it. Now, that description of one evening sums up many of my nights during that period of my life. But there's more. Not unlike the identity dilemma my son would face after high school, when he was five, I was trying to figure out who I was as an individual woman in the world, separate from my role as mother. I could tell F. F Scott Fitzgerald I was making the best of it, that I was mostly proud of how I handled single motherhood, but I was coming up on a decision. I was getting ready to transfer from community college to UNC Wilmington, and I had to declare a major. I looked at my five-year-old son and struggled with what the right choice looked like. Could I be who I truly wanted to be in the world? Could I take my ever-evolving selfhood and find sameness in others and contribute my individuality with community? Could I do all that? and pay the bills. To quote poet Maya Angelou, 
My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. The thing is, to get from survive to thrive, at least in my experience, takes a lot of effort. And in the beginning stages, there's limited success, which makes it difficult, seemingly impossible, to persevere. But, to quote Michelangelo, the, 20th, the 16th century artist, who to many is the original Renaissance man, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. Fast forward to 2006. I'm 32, a single mother, a sales rep for a wine distributor, a college graduate with a degree in creative writing. After years of walking in circles, I had actively engaged with the unknown. I had reached for living a life true to myself and chose to study my passion, writing poetry, which is also why I worked a job that had nothing to do with my art. The job was actually a natural path from my first career of working in the restaurant industry, an industry I enjoyed from working as a line cook to a manager. If I didn't have the poetry bug, I may have owned a restaurant by now. But that's the thing about a, a calling or a passion or that voice and that itch, your need, a desire to do something that just won't go away the thing that I identified as living a life true to myself. By the end of my first year as a sales rep, sales rep, I would wake in the morning and cry as I got ready for work. Now I'm going to tell you that you know a job is not for you when no amount of free wine makes you want to stay. <laughs> But within those first few months of selling wine, I was in the honeymoon period. One night at a wine tasting in downtown Wilmington, I met architect Ligon Flynn. Born and raised in Tryon, North Carolina, Ligon was admitted to the North Carolina State School of Design, which is now the College of Design, within the first years of its inception in the early 1950s. He graduated in 1959 and went on to become a prominent North Carolina modern architect. When I met Ligon, he was well past retirement age, but he had yet to receive the memo. I, I offered him sparkling wine and began my spiel on how this specific brand, St. Hilaire, was the first sparkling wine in the White House, brought in by Thomas Jefferson. In turn, he gave me a brief lesson on Monticello Jefferson's estate in Virginia. Ligon then invited me to a wine tasting at his office after the event where he and friends were to compare German Rieslings. Taking full advantage of the perks of the job, I went and stood among a crowd I had never before mingled with. Lawyers, architects, bankers, business people. People I couldn't on the surface identify with. At one point, I was in conversation with a man married to an architect who worked with Ligon. I don't recall what prompted it, but he said, I know you sell wine, but what do you really do? In that moment, as I stood in a room full of people I didn't know, I held my self-worth, my fears, and my insecurities all right there with me also had a new space to believe, to thrive, to be the person I wanted to be in the moment I wanted to be her. Instead of falling back into what I knew, I reached into the unknown for my answer. It was this moment, and I know it was this moment because it changed how I lived in the world. It was this moment when I attained a new level of expertise. And this expertise was in both knowing myself and speaking up for her. I spoke words I had never said before. 
I'm a poet. When I answered the question, my whole body lit up. I felt equally empowered and vulnerable by the sound of the words that came from my mouth. The thing is, at the moment I self-identified as a poet, I had yet to publish a single poem. And this matters. <laughs> I mean, one of the first questions people will ask when someone says they are a writer is whether or not you have a book. <laughs> and I didn't even have a poem. It was the first time I declared the truth about how I move through the world, about what helped me as a human to understand and identify myself and how I fit in the world with other people. For me, I was admitting that I am bound to this act of writing poetry. I have no choice. And since it is core to who I am, it is core to who I want to be. Not only did I put myself out there to people I didn't know, more importantly, I put myself out there to myself, throwing this word poet into the unknown and having to meet her there, work toward her, like saying it in a room full of strangers was a way to throw a carrot out at the end of the stick. Not only did I get engage with the unknown, I, desert, I turned my desire into action. And that allowed the universe to say, okay, now that you have stated this is what you want, will you show up? As it turned out, Ligon had overheard our conversation. He would ask me to help him write down his philosophy on architecture, and I would do so part-time through the year. Then I would begin to cry before going out to sell wine. Selling wine had a more sure-footed economic future, and I worked with people who loved their career, which made me feel I could one day love it too. But once again, I said yes to the poet voice and told Ligon I wanted to work for him full time. He hired me and I researched and wrote about architectural space for two years while I returned to graduate school for poetry until he suffered a stroke in 2009. Why did Ligon ask me to write for him? He said it came down to three things. One, I knew about wine and could double as his wine buyer priorities, right? Uh, two, my eldest son's name is Taliesin, which is the name of architect Frank Lloyd Wright's personal houses. Three, I was a poet. The cultivation of identity in the context of acquiring, believing, and discovering is similar to the work of turning survive into thrive or aiming high instead of low when it comes to following your dreams. All of it requires a steadfast relationship to improving and refining goals. And all of this work is in the face of possibly not hitting the mark. Which is why I don't embrace the dream as a fixed point or an end goal. Instead, I see my dream as a continual exploration. The dream is, in fact, the journey. If I hadn't answered the question, what do you really do with 100% truth? If I hadn't actively engaged with the unknown? If I hadn't decided to live a life true to myself, to be who I wanted to be? Ligon never would have asked me to write for him. He never would have known I was a poet. And even as I made the self-proclamation, I didn't know it was the act of putting it out there that allowed me to find sameness and community as I found with Ligon. I didn't even fully realize this until I wrote that last sentence. I wish... I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. What I was being asked that spring evening back in 2006 wasn't the usual, so what do you do? He asked me, what do you really do? What I heard was, what is your truest self? <laughs>